If you have a Bible, please turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15 will be there here in just a second. And greetings from the North American Mission Board. We love all of our partners in the Southern Baptist Convention, but for me, the partnership with the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary is, is very sweet. This is uh, home for me. This is where I grew up, and I love this school. I love its faculty. I love the administration. And I hope that you at Southern Seminary and Boyce College know what a great opportunity you have here. Uh, I love your, your president. I've known your president. I was just talking with Mrs. Moeller uh, beforehand uh, since I was a sophomore in high school. That's when we uh, came here to Louisville and we, and we met them. And, and instantly, one of the things you need to know about that, about that time period is uh, certainly my dad, uh, is Dr. Danny Aiken, uh, and he's preached here many times. And, and so he's my hero. I, I grew up wanting to be like my dad. And, 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 and at that age, I had a I think a healthy love and fear of my dad at that age as a, as a teenager. I, I think both were appropriate because I, I honored him as, as this hero in my life. But, but also as I got to know Dr. Moeller, I got to know him more personally than, than many uh, students who've come through Southern because of that relationship. Dr. Moeller was a, was a man that when I was in high school, I was fascinated with. We would go eat with him at O Charlie's, uh, okay, all the time. And I just, one of the, I mean, obviously he was my dad's boss, and so I, I was kind of enthralled with, with that, and he, he spoke on CNN, and he was interviewed by Larry King, and so I thought, man, this guy is incredible. But, but I also thought, as I got to know him, like, this is the smartest man I've ever met. Like, we, we watched the Crimson, Crimson Tide, not the, the athletic, not, not Alabama, we watched the Crimson Tide movie at their house, okay, not the... Not, not a football game, and he was telling us everything about submarines. And I was just like, man, if I, if I ever get on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, I know who my phone a friend is going to be. It's going to be, it's going to be Dr. Moeller. And, uh, but when I was a, a junior in high school, I have a twin brother, Nathan, we were juniors in high school. One night, we had kind of just got our, our driver's license, so we didn't have any money. We're calling around our friends, like, we want to go hang out. We don't have any money. And so one of our friends lived in a subdivision out at Middletown called Lake Forest, and they said, hey, there's a, there's a park here with like benches and swing sets and stuff. Let's just go, let's go hang out there. And we're like, okay, great. So went there about eight, nine o'clock at night and we're hanging out and we're swinging on the swings and we're just kind of goofing off like teenagers. And all of a sudden we see a cop car pull in and, and the lights go on and this cop comes out and starts shining a light in our face and says, what are y'all, what are y'all doing here? And we're like, well, we're just, just hanging out. And uh, he said, did you notice the sign out front? I'm like, no, what sign? It says, you're not supposed to be in here after dusk. So, our bad, we, we can leave. Nope, we need to round you up and take you to jail. And I was like, oh my goodness, are you, are you, are you serious? Like, we, we're just hanging out in the park. We're not doing anything. And, and so he, he puts us in the back of his cop car and drives us to the police station in Middletown. And so I've got to call my dad uh, to come pick us up. And so again, healthy love and fear, he's, he's my hero. So get the phone call. call. Never thought I would have to ask for my phone call, right? And so I'm, I'm, I'm calling my dad, and he picks up. I say, hey, Dad, where are you? What are you doing? Uh, we're at Grader's eating ice cream with the molars. What are you doing? <laughs> uh, we're in the Middletown police station. We've been arrested for trespassing. You are what? <laughs> yeah, um, could you just come get us, please? And so my dad hangs up the phone, looks at my mom, looks at the molars, and says, the twins have been arrested for trespassing, and they are at the Middletown Jail. Dr. Moeller, you want to come with me to pick them up? <laughs> and, uh, I, and Dr. Moeller said, yes. And so they came, they, my dad and Dr. Moeller came and bailed me and my brother uh, out of jail as, as juniors in high school. And... Uh, he was, very, he was very kind, and, and, and both he and my dad thought it was kind of silly. But So I'm, I'm, I love Dr. Moeller. I'm grateful to him, not just for his investment in my life, but because he and my dad rescued me from a life of hardened criminality <laughs> and, and just indiscriminately trespassing in parks all over the place. So thank you, Dr. Moeller, and thank you for letting me be here with you today. I, I love this school. It's where I met my wife, Ashley, and this is where we started our family, and so it's, it's a great honor to be here. We've been told, and many of you probably are aware of this, Andy Stanley preached a series of sermons back in the spring following his Easter message in which he told us that we need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. And the reason why 
he says we need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament is because many have lost faith, have walked away from Christianity because of something in the Bible, especially the Old Testament. He says we we were given a Bible, we're told either all of it's true or none of it's true. If any part of it is is proved to be false, the whole house of cards falls. And so people who couldn't accept uh, all the history of the Old Testament or people who found it hard to believe all the miracles of the Old Testament or people who couldn't accept the creation account and thought it was kind of a myth, when, when those things started to creep into their mind, all of a sudden the entire house of cards fell and they walked away from the faith. And he says, that's not Christianity. He says the entire Old Testament can fall, it can go away. The question of Christianity is, did Jesus rise from the dead? And the eyewitnesses said that he did. That's, that's what Christianity is about. That's the foundation of our faith. And so he says, unhitching ourselves from the Old Testament frees those who can't accept the worldview of the Old Testament, the value system depicted in ancient Israel. We, we can unhitch so that we can rescue the faith of the younger generation. He, he points to places in the Old Testament where he says, the apostles unhitched themselves from the Old Testament. And he says, we need to do the same and for the same reason. As James says in Acts 15 of the Jerusalem Council, we need to not make it difficult for Gentiles who are turning to God. And so he says, the, the faith of the next generation, the, the faith of your neighbor, the, your faith maybe at some point depends on us getting this right and unhitching ourselves from the Old Testament. And he even says in those messages, I, I want other pastors and leaders to consider what we've done and to, to maybe follow suit. But here's the problem. Andy Stanley is, is, has been rightly critiqued. Dr. Moeller's done a great job and and many have, have, have kind of called out the issues and what he said. But the, the problem for me isn't just what he said and the argument that he's making. The problem for me is that other pastors, pastors on our team, pastors that, that we go to their, to their conferences and listen to them preach, have functionally unhitched themselves from the Old Testament. Our guys, those who are our best, have actually taken Andy's advice. When Andy says in those sermons, you need to spend more time here and and less time there. And some of our best and our brightest have followed suit. John MacArthur has said on multiple occasions that he spent the, the four decades of his ministry, he spent 42 years preaching the New Testament. And when he finished, he spent a couple years in the Old Testament. Now he's back in the New Testament. And the, the fruit of that is that, that John MacArthur has preached 110 more sermons in the book of Matthew than the entire Old Testament combined. He's preached more sermons in the book of Luke than the entire Old Testament combined. He's preached more sermons in the book of Romans than the entire Old Testament combined. He's preached more sermons in 1st and 2nd Corinthians than the entire Old Testament combined. John Piper has preached as about the same number of sermons in the book of Romans as the entire Old Testament combined. He's preached a hundred more sermons in Romans and Hebrews, two letters in the New Testament, than the entire Old Testament combined. Tim Keller, in his preaching lectures with Edmund Clowney, says about the book of Esther that there are parts of the book of Esther where where the, the Jews slaughter some of the Persians that I would shy away from in the New York context because it would take too much time to explain what is going on. And so some of our best and our brightest have functionally unhitched themselves from the Old Testament. Now, please hear me. My my purpose here today is is not to throw shade at all these leaders. Like I have learned a ton from all four of these men, even Andy Stanley, I've learned a ton from them. So my purpose here is not to throw shade, but to, to talk about the result of either consciously or unconsciously and just functionally unhitching ourselves from our Old Testament is that that Stanley is right when he says that our people cannot withstand the onslaught of attacks, apologetic attacks that come against the Old Testament. The reason why is not because they can't be answered, but because they haven't been taught, because they haven't been equipped. They can't answer somebody who says to them, well, why do you insist on following the Levitical code when it comes to homosexual marriage, but, but not when it comes to wearing polyester? They can't withstand, as Anley points out, the, the attack from the new atheists on the Bible's morality and the, the genocidal directives. We're going to look at one here in 1 Samuel 15 that, that God has in the Old Testament. Dawkins has said that the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. He's a sadistic, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. And Stanley says about that quote, 
what's your 19-year-old daughter going to do about that? How's she going to stand up against that? You know what? That's a good question. And that's the question that I want us to answer this morning for the sake of 19-year-olds in this room and for the sake of those that we are going to minister to. Yeah, Andy's argument has some issues. One of the main ones being that, that pointing out that the apostles say that the Mosaic covenant is provisional doesn't mean that they've unhitched themselves from the entire Old Testament. That's a kind of a, a sleight of hand in the argument. But the bigger issue for me here when it comes to whether you're consciously or unconsciously unhitching yourself from the Old Testament is, is a question of mission. I don't think we can have our cake and eat it too. I don't think we can say, well, just ignore all the Old Testament when Andy and others agree, Jesus affirms all of it. The one that you said, Christianity rises or falls with the resurrection of Jesus and the eyewitness testimony. And because Jesus was raised from the dead, everything that he said, all of his claims are validated. Well, Jesus affirmed it all. He affirmed the origin story. He affirmed Adam and Eve. He affirmed the historicity of Jonah. He affirmed the most, if you want to say, genocidal event in the entire Old Testament, which is the flood that wiped out the entire world except for Noah's family. And not only does he affirm it, he says the final judgment is going to be exactly like that. And so you need to be ready for it. And so we have to be able to answer these questions, not just for skeptics like the new atheists, but for coworkers of your members that are asking these kinds of questions about the Levitical code and about these ethnic cleansings in the Old Testament. For teenagers in your youth groups who are asking these questions. For the unreached on the mission field that we're going to. It was about four years ago, I was in a Muslim country, Central Asia. We were walking down the street trying to find some food and we met some uh, Muslim young men and started talking to them. I was, I was with the missionary, he's translating. And so I'm, I'm trying to share the gospel with them and, and the, the Muslim, one of the men looks at me and says, well, one reason I can't be a Christian is because the God of Christianity is so violent. And I was like, hey, hold on a second, make sure you, did you translate that right? Like he, he's a Muslim and he's asking me, a Christian, why our God is so violent. And the missionary is like, yeah, that's exactly what he said. And so I had to be able to answer that question and be able to explain to him what God is, is doing there. And so what I want us to do is how do we answer these questions? Because I'll be honest with you, when I read 1 Samuel 15, there are parts that make me wince. Like when it talks about wipe out, not just the women and the children, the nursing infants. Like that, that makes me kind of pause and say, what, what's, what's going on here? And so let's, let's answer this question, just, just one of these difficult texts here in 1 Samuel 15. We're going to read most of the chapter together. And if you would, please stand to your feet out of reverence for reading the words of God. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1, these words were written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telaim and 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, go depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen of the fattened calves and the lambs, all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless they devoted to destruction." The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry and he cried to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel. And behold, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul and Saul said to him, blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission 
and said, go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil of sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel, Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Then he said, I have sinned. Yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me, that I may, I may bow before the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Lord. Then Samuel said, bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. So why does God command the slaughter of the Amalekites? Two reasons that we see in this text. Number one, because God judges human sin. Because God judges human sin. The Lord, through Samuel, comes to Saul and tells him to go devote the Amalekites to destruction, put them to the ban, because they attacked Israel when Israel had come out of Egypt. And so when Israel was wandering through the desert, they're, they're weary, they're vulnerable, they have no border, they have no wall, they're in a, a really desperate situation. That is the time when Amalek tried to defeat them and tried to attack them. And so because of that, three different times in the Old Testament, in, in Exodus and in Deuteronomy and other places, God says, because of that, I am eventually going to blot out Amalek from the earth. So three times the Lord promised, I'm going to wipe them out. And so now is the time. God is pouring out his judgment on Amalek for their sin. It's very similar to what we see in, in other places where God commands conquest of Jericho, for example. It's in Genesis 15, the Lord says to Abraham, hundreds of years before this happens, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. I, I'm going to give them more time to rebel and more time to commit iniquity before I finally hold them to account. And so this has been decades and hundreds of years since they have come up out of the land of, of Egypt. And so God has been patient with Amalek, but he says, now that you have some rest in the land, now that the kingdom has been set up, now is the time to pour out this wrath on the Amalekites. This is not a war of conquest, right? He's, he's telling them, don't take any spoil. You're not trying to take their land. You're not trying to do any of these things. All you're doing is meeting out justice. You're doing exactly what I've said in the law that I was going to do. Again, as, he, as Samuel says to Agag at the, at, the, at the end, you've made women childless. And so now you're going, your, your mom's gonna be childless. It's a war of justice. God is holding them accountable for their sin. And so Genesis 15, for example, when God's talking about the Amorites or even here, 1 Samuel 15, about the Amalekites, we don't just see the wrath of God and we don't just see the judgment of God, we see his patience. He's been patient, he's given them time despite their continual opposition against God and against Israel, now he is going to pour out his judgment. And so if you're upset with 1 Samuel 15, then you're upset not with the specifics of what's going on here, but you're upset with the concept of judgment at all. The fact that God would hold anybody accountable, the fact that God would punish anyone for their sin. Listen, that's not just an Old Testament problem, that's a New Testament problem. Isn't Jesus in the New Testament talks a lot about hell and about the wrath of God. And so here's the problem. The, the problem for most people is not that we don't want a God of justice. I think everybody at some level deep down would admit they want a God of justice. The reason why people are 
crying out about injustice in the world is because deep down they want justice. They're saying, listen, there's, people are being oppressed. People are being attacked. Things are unfair, right? We come out of the womb saying that. Like, you know, your parents have to say back to you, life's not fair. And so deep down, we, we see injustice. We, we don't like it. We want there to be justice in the world. We don't want people to be oppressed and hurt. The problem isn't that we don't want a God who judges. We just want a God who judges the sins that we want him to judge in the way that we want him to judge them and in the timing with which we want him to judge them. And that's what we want, but that's not the way things work. If God is going to step in, if we're gonna cry out, like the Psalms cry out, God, when will you wake up? When will you see what's happening here? When will you act? How long, O oh Lord? But if God steps in to deal with the injustice in the world, that means he's gonna to have to deal with your part in it. And he's gonna to have to hold you accountable as well. So the Bible is very clear. God is committed to eradicating sin from the world and, and making the world new. Sin will not go unchecked forever, but that's bad news for you. And that's bad news for me. And so we want justice. We want judgment. We just don't want it the way that God does it or in the timing with which he does it. But now he has finally had enough and he's going to hold Am, the, uh, Amalek responsible for what they have done. And so he's been patient, but now is the time to pour out his judgment. So now that's very clear. He, he, he says that to Saul, right? I want you to go because of what they did to Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. But the question is, and you, you may have this question, John, I, I get that. They attacked Israel in a time when they were vulnerable and they shouldn't have done that. And so now they're being held accountable. But what about the, the babies? Like what about the innocent, this innocent generation, the, the younger kids who, who had no part in that and they're not men of war and, and they're, they're just innocent. They've, they've never contributed to this opposition to Israel. What, what about them? Like this doesn't seem fair. And so the second thing I would say about this passage is that God commands the extermination of the Amalekites because he's judging their sin. But secondly, because God so loves the world that he makes sure to send his only son. It's because God so loves the world that he makes sure to send his only son. Now, first, before we dive into that, it's very clear in this passage, we don't just see the wrath of God, but we actually see the mercy of God on display because there, there's a pattern throughout the Old Testament and throughout, throughout the Bible. And Jim Hamilton's pointed this out in, in his book. There's this pattern of God showing mercy to people through judgment and, and God making a way out for groups of people. We see this over and over and over again. When God is pouring out his judgment, there's always a group of people that he's offering a way out, that he's showing mercy to. We see this in the flood, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna wash the world of the sin and the wickedness and the violence, and I'm gonna rescue Noah and his family through the flood. We see this at Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen, when, when, when God goes to Lot, and, and the, the angel goes to Lot and he says, listen, go get your family, get your daughters and your sons-in-law. These are men who were born and raised in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God says, I will show them mercy if they will leave. And they, they laugh at Lot and they, they think he's joking around and they, they don't take that offer of mercy, but God is offering a way out, not just to the descendants of Abraham, but to the world, to, to Gentiles. We see the exact same thing at Jericho, right? He pours out wrath on the Amorites, on, on Jericho, but Rahab and her family are rescued, Gentiles rescued from the wrath of God. And we see the exact same thing here in verses four through six with the Kenites, those who, uh, the descendants of Moses' father-in-law, they were kind to Israel in Exodus 18, right after Amalek had attacked them in Exodus 17. And so he says, because of your kindness, I'm giving you an opportunity, come out from there. We're about to attack, we're gonna lay siege to the city, you come out and you'll be spared the destruction. And so God shows mercy to the Gentiles. Anybody who says to you that the God of the Old Testament is an angry and vengeful God, listen, we see all throughout the Old Testament what God says about himself, I am slow to anger, I'm abounding in loving kindness. I'm one who forgives iniquity. He is entirely merciful and he provides a way out of the judgment. Now, why, why judge the, the women and the children, the nursing infants? Honestly, again, it, it's God's love for the world that's behind this command. Let me explain kind of just briefly what's going on here. Saul started out really well as king, 
uh, and, and did a good job at the beginning. But as we see here, he, he kind of starts to be affected by the approval ratings of the people. And so he, he sins against God. He doesn't fully carry out God's command. And so half obedience is full disobedience, as Samuel points out to him. And what's really, Peter Lightheart points out the, the, the interesting play on the, the word voice here, right? Is that, that Saul is told to obey the voice of the Lord, but instead Samuel says, that I'm, I'm hearing the voice of the sheep and the voice of the oxen, which proves that you didn't listen to the voice of the Lord. Instead, you listen to the voice of the people. And so Saul, because of that wanting the approval ratings, he spares Agag, he spares the best of the plunder. And as a result, God comes to him through Samuel and says, I'm taking the kingdom away from you. He's going to give it uh, to David. And so at the end of the story, Samuel tries to finish the job that Saul didn't finish. And he brings Agag out and he hacks him to pieces there before the Lord at Gilgal. Because of Agag's sin, because of Amalek's sin. As God even said uh, through Samuel that they are sinners and that's why they're being put to destruction. And so he finally finishes the job, or so you would think. Now, again, you say, why, why does God command this? There, there's two things just in terms of illustration, uh, two things I want you to remember. If anybody ever asked you this question, why does God command slaughter of people in the Old Testament? Two reasons. Number one, John 3.16 and number two, Godfather part two, okay? John 3, 16, Godfather part two. One of those is more important than the other, but I'll, I'll explain. Uh, John 3, 16 and Godfather part two. Godfather part two, probably the best sequel in the history of cinema. Sorry, Star Wars fan, fans, it's not Empire Strikes Back. It's Godfather part two. And in that story, if, you, if you've never seen that movie, it's, it's been out for like 50 years. So spoiler alert is coming, but you've had time to see it. So um, I... In Godfather Part Two, it's, it's following the, this, this massive mafia family um, in New York and then later in Vegas uh, who comes from Don Corleone, okay? Uh, Vito Corleone is his, his name. And Vito Corleone grew up in a little town in Sicily called Corleone, Sicily. And that's why he takes that as his last name when he comes to America. But in that city, uh, in Corleone, Sicily, there's a mob boss named Don Ciccio. And Don Ciccio kills... Vito's dad, Vito's mom, and Vito's brother, and tries to kill Vito, but he is, uh, he is hidden away, and he, he escapes, get on, gets on a boat, comes to Ellis Island, and comes into America. And then, over time, he, he goes from being this, this small little immigrant child to this powerful mafia boss uh, who is running uh, organized crime in New York. But what happens when, when Vito grows up? Well, he, he goes back to Corleone, Sicily. He goes to Don Ciccio's house and he starts to talk to him and explain who he is. And my name is Vito Corleone. And Don Ciccio's like, oh, you took the name of our, of our town. What was your given name? And he says, Vito Andolini and takes out a knife and kills uh, Don Ciccio and exacts his vengeance because of what Don Ciccio had done to his family. And that's the point here in 1 Samuel 15 is that Amalek is... is determined to wipe out Israel. And if the children are allowed to live and grow, they will at some point seek to eliminate the Jews. And if they eliminate the Jews, that means there's going to be no David. There's going to be no Solomon. There's going to be no Hezekiah. There's going to be no Josiah. There's going to be no Mary. There's going to be no Jesus, which means the world's headed to hell. And that's what's at stake here in 1 Samuel 15. Again, you should read here John 3, 16. God loved the world in this way that he made sure to send his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. This is, is Romans 9, 5, right? It's from the Jews comes the Messiah who is God above all, blessed forever, amen. God is seeing to it that he preserves the line of the Messiah so that he comes into the world to save the world. Now, you may be sitting there saying, John, you're exaggerating. That's not what's at stake. That's not what's going to happen. If the children are allowed to live, they're not going to try to wipe out the, the Jews. Well, my answer to that would be, have you ever read the book of Esther? Have you ever read the book of Esther? Because what's happening in the book of Esther, let me just read this to you just briefly, but here's the, the, the background, okay? This, this man named Mordecai, who is a descendant of Saul, he's a Benjaminite, he's a descendant of Saul from the line of Kish, and this man named Haman who is a descendant of Agag, are locked into a battle. And that battle, if Haman, the Agagite, wins, will mean the extermination of the Jews. Listen to what 
Esther says here in Esther chapter 3, verses 5 uh, and following. And when Haman saw Mordecai, that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. Now skip down verse 10. This is what it says. So the king took his signet ring from his hand, gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and an edict, according to all that Haman commanded, was written to the king's satraps and to the governors all over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. And so the exact same language you see in 1 Samuel 15, destroy them all, women and children, wipe them out. And so we have a descendant of Saul, once again against a descendant of Agag, and the, the livelihood of the Jews, the, 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 the people group known as the Jews is at stake here because he wants to exterminate all of them. And th- this is probably the reason that, don't know for sure, but Mordecai, refuses to bow down to Haman, and and it's possible that he knew the background, that he knew the backstory of who he is and who Haman is, and that's why he refused and he didn't bow down to him. See, what's going on behind the scenes, one of the ways I I like to think about this, and again, in terms of illustration, it's not that I'm endorsing these movies or anything, um, is is the Terminator, okay? The Terminator, if you you think about that that storyline, right, you have a Messiah figure, John Connors, who defeats the machines who've taken over the world and rescues humanity and, and, and all of that. And so what the machines try to do to prevent that salvation from happening, for, prevent this Messiah figure from rescuing uh, humanity is they go back in time to where he's vulnerable when his mom's pregnant with him or when he's a boy and they try to destroy him then before he, he comes to power. And Revelation 12 reveals to us that's something of what Satan has been doing all along the the way behind the scenes, that he's trying to wipe out the line of the Messiah so that the Messiah doesn't come. And so you see this in Egypt where Pharaoh's killing the male children. You, You see this here where Haman wants to exterminate the Jews. You see this with Herod when he's killing the babies there in Matthew chapter two, that he's trying to pick off the Christ while he's vulnerable, why his, his line, his lineage is vulnerable so that he can prevent this salvation from happening. And yet, God sees to it that the line is preserved. That's why he's commanding these things in 1 Samuel 15. And that's why he's protecting them in the book of Esther behind the scenes, even though his name is never mentioned. And so Mordecai, and Esther, these descendants of Saul, finally finish the job and they take care of Agag. And the way, again, this points us to Christ as well, that you have Esther who is uh, being fathered by this adoptive father, her, her uncle, Mordecai, risks her life and on the third day receives life rather than death and foils the plan of Haman and his plan backfires and crushes his own head. And in the process, she saves her people and saves lots of Gentiles in the process. And this is the story of the book of Esther. And so this time in the book of Esther, you see not only is the plan foiled and not only are the enemies defeated, but we see this time that the Jews refuse to take the plunder. We're told multiple times in the book of Esther, they refuse uh, to take the plunder. And so the, the plot twist, the plot reversal is, is, has come full circle. They've taken care of Agag, they've preserved the line, and they're refusing to touch the plunder that the people who they have defeated are leaving behind. And ultimately, again, this points us to Christ, the, the, the one who's going to come into the world, who's going to give his life, be raised on the third day, crushing the dragon's head, and bringing salvation to the world, to Jews and Gentiles alike. And finally, the prophecy of Numbers 24 has come true that the Jacob's king has been exalted and his kingdom has been exalted and Agag has been defeated. God loves the world in this way, that he's gonna do anything 
necessary to make sure that the Christ comes. Now, I just want to ask in the, just a few minutes we have remaining, what does this mean for us? Like what, in terms of practical application, what, what does this mean for us? And just two things I want to share with you quickly. Number one, that, that we are called to forgive those who have wronged us. Okay, we are called to forgive those who have wronged us. As I said, the desire for justice is a good desire. It's an innate desire that's in every single one of us. But desiring to be the one who, who carries out that justice is not a good desire because justice has been given to the son, has not been given to you. To whom does God give the role to judge? Answer, his son. Who is his son in the Old Testament? Israel. And so at specific times with his specific direction, he says, I want you to pour out my judgment on these people because of their sins. In the New Testament, Jesus of Nazareth is the son of God. And Revelation 19 tells us he's the one who's going to return and he's gonna set things right. And he doesn't need our help with that. And we don't have any part to play in that. To the degree that you believe that, you'll let go of your bitterness. To the degree that you believe that, you will refuse to take vengeance. To the degree that you believe that, you will forgive those who have wronged you and you will pray for your enemies. To the degree that you believe that. Tim Keller, in his preaching lectures, uh, is quoting uh, a Croatian theologian named Miroslav Volf, who, who talks about this. I'm going to share this quickly. This is a paraphrase. But Volf says, only those who believe in wrath can really be forgiving people. Only those who believe in a God of justice can be forgiving people. He says, refusing to retaliate requires belief in divine vengeance. He says, my, my idea may be unpopular in the West, but imagine talking to people whose villages have been pillaged, whose wives and daughters have been raped, whose men and brothers have been slaughtered. The only way to prevent violence by us who have been wronged is to insist violence is only legitimate when it comes from God. He says it takes, and this is an amazing line, it takes the quiet of the suburbs to birth the idea that the only way humans will be nonviolent is if they believe in a God who refuses to judge. He says only these people who live in these nice suburbs would have that kind of view of the world. In a land soaked by innocent blood, that idea would die. If God weren't angry at injustice and didn't make a final end to violence, he would not be worthy of our worship. That's what Keller says as he, he draws the point. Skeptics think, skeptics think that if you believe in a God who judges, that that will automatically turn you into a judgmental person, into a violent type of person. And he says, no, the exact opposite is true. If you've been truly wrong, you've been abused, you've been abandoned, you've been abused by a dad or cheated on by a spouse, if you've been hurt in some way, some act of violence has been committed against you, the only way that you'll refuse to get back at your perpetrator is if you have a strong conviction that there is a God who will eventually set that right. John Piper tells us, as he tells us the way that we can overcome bitterness and unforgiveness and, and, and move towards forgiveness and love of our enemies is to understand that the person who wronged you, there's, there's two options available for them. Either they're a Christian and their sin against you was dealt with at the cross of Jesus Christ or that person is not a Christian and their sin will be dealt with eternally and God doesn't need your help with that. If you refuse to forgive those who have wronged you, it's not because you, you, know, you, you believe in a God who, who just doesn't hold anybody accountable. The reason why you refuse to forgive is because you don't adequately believe the gospel. Because in, in your holding a grudge, what you're saying is, I think that the death of Jesus is enough to forgive me the sins I've committed against him, but it's not enough to forgive the sins that have been committed against me. And that's, that's a failure to believe the gospel. Once Christ has taken the wrath of God that we see here in 1 Samuel 15 at the cross, then our role is to forgive our enemies and to love them and to pray for them. And so forgive those who have wronged you. And secondly, finally, advance the gospel to all peoples. God has called us to a different task than taking up arms. And, and Andy Stanley rightly, and one of the things that he does rightly in his sermons is he critiques the way some people, some Christians mix and match the Old Testament with the New Testament. And I would say is a misinterpretation of the Old Testament. One example of that just a few years ago, there was a, 
a pastor in Alabama, a Baptist pastor in Alabama, wrote an article to the Baptist state paper in Alabama in which he was furious that some SBC leaders were, were saying that we should show mercy to Syrian refugees. And he was just, he was irate about this. And here's what he said. He, he basically wanted to apply. He, he argued that we need to apply 1 Samuel 15 to these people groups. And he said, perhaps our leaders should study the Old Testament when God gave specific instructions to destroy these people, even their women, children, and animals. It's a Baptist pastor in Alabama wrote that. And so let me be clear about two things. Number one, the United States of America is not God's chosen people. Like that shouldn't be hard, but we have to state that over and over again. The United States of America is not God's chosen people. And secondly, the role that God has given to government to protect its citizenry is different from the role that God has given to his church, which is, I didn't, I don't, you're not to judge the world. You, you are to judge those inside the church. You're not to judge the world. We, we've been given a commission to take the message of God's mercy to the world. And that, that mission, again, we, we see started well before Jesus stood on the Mount of Olives and, and gave the great commission and then levitated into the air and floated up to heaven. Well before that, you have in the book of Esther where Persians are being shown mercy through the seed of Abraham. And you have in 1 Samuel 15 where Kenites are being shown mercy through the offspring of Abraham. And you have at Jericho, Rahab being shown mercy through the offspring of of Abraham, and you have Genesis 12, this promise that God has given to Abraham. Through you, through your offspring, I'm going to bless all the peoples of the world. I'm going to bring salvation to all the peoples of the world. And that's why we go to these places. That's why we go to places where if your friends, some of your family members say, why are you going to Central Asia to, to minister among Muslims? Well, you're crazy to go there. And you say, because God loves the world. And he wants the world not to perish. And there are people groups like the Amalekites, like the Canaanites, all over the world, Thai, Mixteco, Kurds, Arabs, all over the world who are perishing without the gospel and they desperately need to hear that God loved the world and he sent his son so they would not perish but have everlasting life. And this is why one of the amazing things we see here in the book of Esther is that, that Esther takes a great risk and the, the reason why she takes this great risk and she's willing to put her life on the line, the reason we should be willing to put our lives on the line is because we know the plan and purpose of God. Do you remember when, when Mordecai comes to her, and we, we all know that, maybe you came to the kingdom for such a time as this, but it's what Mordecai says to her right before that that's so intriguing to me. Because Mordecai says to her, he, he says here in, in chapter four, verses 13 and 14, he says to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. He says, listen, the issue is not whether God's plan is going to be accomplished. It's going to be accomplished. The question is, are you going to be part of it? Or are you going to shrink back and God's going to find somebody else to be a part of it? This is why we should take great risks to go to really tough places with the gospel. Because we know God's plan will go forward. It will not be thwarted. And I don't know about you, I don't want to miss out on that. I can miss out and God can use somebody else, but I want to be a part of that. And so let's, let's be part of God accomplishing his purpose in the world. Let's not shrink back in fear, but let's, let's go to these tough places. And as we go, let's hitch ourselves to the Old Testament, not, not unhitch ourselves for the sake of the world, but let's hitch ourselves to the Old Testament for the sake of the world. And don't just take my word. I'm, I'm a, a PhD in Old Testament and so I'm biased when it comes to the Old Testament. Um, when, when I left my church in Lebanon, the, the interim pastor said to them, you know, we're going to, now that John's gone, we're going to spend some time in a part of the Bible you may have heard of. It's called the New Testament. And uh, they thought that was funny too. Um, but I, don't just take my word for it. Let's, let's take the words of Jesus. Because Jesus says, listen, the resurrection, this is Jesus' words, not mine. The resurrection, a man being raised from the dead, will not be enough to rescue those who are perishing if they will not listen to the explanation from Moses and the prophets about who that resurrected man is. Do you remember this story? Rich man dies, goes to Hades. Poor man Lazarus dies, goes to Abraham's side in paradise. And there's a conversation between Abraham and the rich man and the rich man's in agony. 
in judgment. And he says, send Lazarus to my brother's house, to my father's house. I have five brothers and I don't want them to come to this place of torment. And Abraham says, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he says, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham says, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not repent, even if one goes to them from the dead. And so let's proclaim Moses and the prophets, because Jesus says they were talking about him. You bow your heads and close your eyes. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to hitch ourselves to the Old Testament for the sake of the world. We thank you that You have, from the beginning, had a plan to bring Jesus into the world and to bring salvation to every people group on the planet. Father, I'm so thankful for this place that's training men and women for that task. God, would you use them for your glory? I pray in Jesus' name, amen.